In this video, we will go in-depth and learn how to make a jigsaw puzzle game using C-sharp in Unity. We will start the tutorial with the basics of the Bezier curve, followed by implementing Bezier curves in Unity. We will then move on to creating jigsaw tiles from an existing image using the Bezier curve, then generate a jigsaw board from an image, and then finally create the jigsaw game in Unity. The tutorial is divided into four broad sections, with each containing one or more subsections. You can find the timestamp for each of these sections below in the description. The first section is Implement Bezier Curve using C Sharp in Unity. The second section is Create a Jigsaw Tile from an Existing Image. The third section is Create a Jigsaw Board from an Image. And finally, the fourth section is Create a Jigsaw Puzzle Game in Unity. You can read the written version of this tutorial on our website. You can also find the entire source code of this project in the GitHub repo, the link to which is available below. Without further ado, let's dive right in. In the first section, we will learn how to implement the Bezier curve using C Sharp in Unity. We will then create a sample scene that displays the Bezier curve. We are starting with the Bezier curve, as we will use it to cut an image to create a jigsaw tile. A Bezier curve is a type of parametric curve that is used in computer graphics and animation to define smooth, continuous curves through a set of control points. Bezier curves are named after their inventor, Pierre Bezier, who used them to design car bodies at Renault in the 1960s. A Bezier curve is defined by a set of control points, which are points that lie on or near the curve itself. The number of control points determines the degree of the curve, with a higher degree producing a more complex curve. The most common Bezier curves are cubic Bezier curves, which are defined by four control points. To generate a Bezier curve, a series of intermediate points are calculated between the control points. These intermediate points are then used to connect the control points, creating a smooth, continuous curve. The generic definition of a point in the Bezier curve is as shown in the equation, where t is a parameter that ranges from 0 to 1. It is often referred to as the parameter of the curve, or the curve parameter. When t equals 0, the Bezier curve evaluates to the starting point defined by the first control point PO. When t equals 1, the curve evaluates to the ending point defined by the last control point PN. Intermediate values of t produce points along the curve between the control points, resulting in the smooth interpolation characteristic of Bezier curves. In essence, t controls the position along the curve and is used to generate points on the curve by interpolating between the control points. To implement the Bezier points using Unity, we will need to simplify the equation. By expanding and simplifying the binomial coefficients, as shown, we get what is known as Bernstein basis polynomials of degree n. In plain English, this equation defines a basis function used in spline interpolation, where t is a parameter ranging from 0 to 1, i represents the index of the basis function, and n represents the degree of the b-spline curve. The equation calculates the contribution of each control point to the final curve position at parameter t. For an n-degree curve, there will be n plus 1 control point. When the number of control points is 2, or a degree of 1, or n equals 1, a Bezier curve becomes a straight line and is equivalent to linear interpolation. When the number of control points is 3, or a degree of 2, or n equals 2, a Bezier curve becomes a parabola. Our first task will be to implement a Bezier curve given a set of control points. For the sake of this tutorial, we will implement the Bezier curve in C Sharp using a predefined lookup table of values. Let's create a new Unity 2D project and name it Jigsaw Puzzle Game. Create a new scene or rename the default scene to scene underscore Bezier curve.
Now, make a new folder in the assets directory and call it scripts. This folder is where we will put all our C-sharp script files. Right-click on the scripts folder in the Unity Editor's project window and create a new C-sharp script. Name it Bezier Curve. Double-click and open it in Visual Studio or your favorite editor. Remove Mono Behavior. As we do not want this class to derive from Mono Behavior, the start and the update methods. Now, let's declare a function that returns an interpolated measure point given t, where t can be between 0 and 1, both inclusive, and a list of control points. This function will correspond to the measure curve equation. Note that we made the function static so that we do not have to instantiate a Bezier curve class to get the Bezier points given a set of control points. This function should be self-sustainable and should do our job of calculating the Bezier point. We will now create a function to calculate the binomial coefficient with inputs n and i, both integer values. To do so, we will have to calculate the values of the factorial of n, the factorial of i, and the factorial of ni. We can implement a function called factorial that calculates the factorial value given an integer input. Even better, we can pre-calculate the factorial values of numbers up to a maximum value of n, let's say 16 or 18, and use that. So any Bezier curve that has a degree of this maximum value or less will be able to create the Bezier curve. We can go beyond this maximum value and make a generic factorial function, but this value will suffice for our job for now. Now. With this lookup table, we are okay to proceed with the implementation of the binomial coefficient. Note that the function is private, as we will only allow internal access to this function. We did not do a validation check if n less than equals 18. We want the caller of this function to ensure that n less than equals 18. Next, we will calculate the Bernstein basis polynomials shown by the equation on screen. To do so, we will need to calculate the binomial coefficient and the two power terms. We have already calculated the binomial coefficient and we will make use of it. Finally, we complete implementing the Bezier point function that we had declared before. This calculation of the Bezier point is just the summation of the Bernstein basis polynomials for all the control points. We store the degree of the curve into a variable called n. The degree of a Bezier curve is the number of control points minus 1. If this number exceeds 18, it means more than 18 control points are being used. If the condition is true, a warning message is logged indicating that the maximum allowable control points for the tutorial is 18. Then, the remove range method is used to remove the excess control points from the control points list. It starts removing from the index 18 up to the end of the list, effectively keeping only the first 18 control points. In our code, we also handle cases where the parameter t is outside the range 0, 1. 
If t is less than or equal to zero, it returns the first control point. If t is greater than or equal to one, it returns the last control point. This ensures the Bezier curve calculation stays within the defined range of control points. After that, we calculate a point on a Bezier curve based on the parameter t and the list of control points. We initialize a vector p to store the resulting point. Then, we iterate through each control point using a loop. Within the loop, we compute the Bernstein polynomial value for each control point at the given parameter t, multiply it by the corresponding control point, and accumulate the result in page finally, we return the accumulated point p, which represents a point on the Bezier curve, determined by the parameter t. We introduce a function named pointless3 to generate a list of 3D points that trace along a Bezier curve, which is defined by a provided list of control points. Within this function, we iterate over a range of parameter values from 0 to 1, utilizing a specified interval, defaulting to 0.01. .01. Employing the Bernstein polynomial formula, we calculate the corresponding points on the curve for each parameter value. These calculated points are then stored in a list, which is returned upon completion. By discretizing the Bezier curve in this manner, the function facilitates straightforward visualization and manipulation of the curve within 3D space, offering enhanced control and versatility. After we have implemented for three-dimensional Bezier point and Bezier curve, we now do the same for a two-dimensional space. We copy and paste the code for point three and pointless three and adapt them to a two-dimensional space. We name these functions point two and pointless two. We have implemented the Bezier curve for a two-dimensional and a three-dimensional space. We shall now proceed to test our implementation by visualizing the curves. First, we create a point prefab to represent a control point on the screen visually. For this, we will use a circular sprite. Right-click and add a new circle sprite. Rename the sprite as point and add a circle collider component to it. Now, create a new script and name it point underscore viz. Add it to the point game object. Double click point underscore viz script and open it in Visual Studio or your favorite editor. We want this sprite to be able to be selected and dragged using our mouse. Add a private variable named mOffset and add on mouse down, on mouse drag, and on mouse up methods and implement the necessary code to use mouse click to select the sprite and drag to move it. The on mouse down function is triggered when the user clicks the mouse button while hovering over the game object this script is attached to. It first checks if the mouse pointer is over a UI element using the event system. If it is, the function returns early. Otherwise, it calculates the offset between the game object's current position and the position of the mouse click on the screen. This offset is necessary to maintain the relative position of the game object while dragging. On mouse drag executes continuously while the mouse button is held down and the cursor moves. Similar to on mouse down, it checks for UI elements and converts cursor position to world space, adjusting for the offset to smoothly move the game object with the cursor. On mouse up is called when the mouse button is released after dragging. It also checks for UI elements and can include cleanup or additional actions, though it's currently empty in this implementation. Create a new folder called Resources in Assets. Now create a new folder called Prefabs in the Resources folder. Drag and drop this point sprite into the Prefabs folder and name it Point Prefab and then remove point from the scene. For the final phase of the Bezier curve visualization, right-click on the hierarchy window and add a new empty game object. 
Rename this empty game object to Bezier underscore viz. We will use this game object to display our control points and the BZA curve. Select Bezier underscore viz and add a new script component called Bezier underscore viz. Double click on Bezier underscore viz script and open it in Visual Studio or your favorite editor. We create a public variable called control points list in the Bezier underscore viz class. This list contains dummy control points initialized with specific Vector2 coordinates. These points serve as a starting point for testing and visualizing Bezier curves within the Unity environment. We can also adjust or add new control points directly through the Unity inspector, providing flexibility for experimentation. Furthermore, later on, we will provide code that allows for the insertion of new control points by double-clicking on the screen during runtime, enhancing interactivity and ease of use for manipulating Bezier curves. We now add the point prefab variable that holds a reference to a game object prefab that represents each control point visually in the Unity scene. This prefab is instantiated for each control point, allowing for easy manipulation and visualization of the points. Additionally, we will utilize the line renderer component to draw straight lines connecting the control points and the Bezier curve. The mLine renderers array holds references to these line renderer components, enabling the drawing of lines with specified properties such as width and color. Furthermore, the endpoint game objects list stores references to the instantiated control point game objects, allowing for convenient access and manipulation of the control points during runtime. Lastly, properties such as line width, line width BZA, line color, and Bezier curve color are used to store the visual properties of the lines, providing flexibility for customization and adjustment. All these elements will work together to facilitate the visualization and manipulation of Bezier curves within the Unity environment. We will now implement a function private line renderer create line within the Bezier underscore viz class. This function will be responsible for dynamically creating and configuring a new line renderer component for visualizing lines in the Unity scene. When called, it instantiates a new game object, attaches a line renderer component to it, and sets up its properties such as material and color. By encapsulating this functionality within a separate function, the code maintains modularity and allows for easy creation of line renderer components with consistent settings throughout the script. The start method in the Bezier underscore viz class is executed once when the script is initialized. Within this method, we will create the actual lines for visualizing connections between control points and the Bezier curve. We will instantiate two line renderer objects and initialize them using the create line function, which sets up their properties such as material and color. We will then set names to these line renderer objects, allowing us to distinguish them within the Unity scene hierarchy. Furthermore, we will also create instances of control points by instantiating the point prefab game object for each control point defined in the control points list. Each instantiated control point game object is given a unique name based on its index in the list and added to the endpoint game objects list for further reference and manipulation during runtime. Go to Unity Editor and associate the point prefab with the point prefab we created earlier. Click Play and verify whether the control points are visible on the Unity game runtime. The update method in the Bezier underscore viz class is called once per frame in Unity.
It will be responsible for updating the visualization of the Bezier curve and control points. Within this method, two line renderer objects are retrieved from the mLine renderer's array. We make one of these line renderer to represent the straight lines connecting the control points and the other to represent the Bezier curve itself. We extract the positions of the control points from their respective game objects and store them in the points list. We then update the line renderer to display the straight lines between the control points. Let's go to Unity Editor. Set the line width to be 0.1 and click play. You should be able to view the straight lines connecting the control points. Now we set the curve renderer to display the Bezier curve based on the control points using the Bezier curve pointless 2 method. We also set the visual properties such as color, width, and position count for the curve renderer and update the positions accordingly to visualize the Bezier curve dynamically as the scene is updated. Let's go to Unity Editor, click Play, and you should be able to see the Bezier curve created based on the control points. If you face any error or see any anomaly, then go through the source code, debug, and rectify the errors. Like in our case, we made an error in the binomial function. Overall, we use the update method to ensure that the visualization of the Bezier curve and control points remains up to date with any changes during runtime in the Unity environment. We now move on to implement the functionality of inserting new control points by double-clicking on the screen. For this, we implement the onGUI method in the Bezier underscore viz class. This method will be responsible for adding functionality to insert new control points by double-clicking on the screen during runtime in the Unity environment. Within this method, an event object E is retrieved, representing the current event being processed by Unity. If the event is a mouse event, the method checks if it corresponds to a double-click event with the left mouse button. If these conditions are met, the method calculates the world position of the mouse click and calls the insert new control point method with this position as an argument. The insert new control point method takes a vector 2 position P as input and adds a new control point at that position. It first checks if the maximum number of control points, 18, has been reached to prevent exceeding this limit. If not, it instantiates a new control point game object using the point prefab at the specified position. The name of the new game object is set to distinguish it from existing control points, and it is added to the endpoint game objects list for further reference and manipulation during runtime. Additionally, if the maximum limit is reached, a debug log is printed indicating that no more control points can be created. Go to your Unity editor and add an event system so that we can capture mouse inputs. Click play to run the application. You can now double click and insert new control points. Play around the application and try out how inserting different control points affect the curve. We have come to the end of section one implement Bezier curve using C sharp in Unity. In the next section, we will create a template Bezier curve and cut an image into a jigsaw tile. In this second section, we will learn how to create a jigsaw tile from an existing image using the Bezier curve. In the first section, we learned how to create a Bezier curve in Unity. In this section, we will create a template curve which we will apply to cut an image to create our jigsaw tile. Before we get into the details on the main topic, let's start a scene and do some basic setup to test and display our features as we move along. Right-click on the project window and create a new scene called scene underscore jigsaw tile. This scene will be our sample scene to test out the various features that we will implement in the following sections. 
First, let's create a set of control points that will define our bezier curve to cut out jigsaw tiles. After experimentation, we came to a conclusion of the provided set of control points. Of course, you can experiment and create your own sets of control points that define your desired bezier curve. These control points are for X from 0 to 100 and Y from minus 20 to 20. The picture here shows these control points and the bezier curve formed by these points. For the rest of this tutorial, we are going to use the above template bezier curve. Let's go ahead and visualize this template curve. Right-click and create an empty game object. Name it template bezier curve. Create a new script, name it template bezier curve and attach it to this game object as a component. Double-click and open the script into Visual Studio or your favorite editor. Copy and paste the code we created in bezier underscore viz in section one of this tutorial. Copy all the codes except on GUI and insert new control point. We won't be needing those functionality here. Replace the variable list of control points with the template control points as shown here. Amend the start method accordingly. By marking the template control points list as static and read-only, we ensure its immutability and shareability across all instances of the template BZA curve class, saving memory and reducing overhead by initializing the control points only once. This approach also mitigates potential concurrency issues in multi-threaded scenarios and facilitates easy access to the control points from other classes without requiring an instance of template BZA curve. Go to Unity Editor and associate the point prefab, then set the line width and line width bezier to 0.5 and 1 respectively. Select the main camera game object and change the transform position X to 50 and size to 50. This way, we can position the view to see our result better. Click play and run. You should now be able to see the template bezier curve. Once we have verified our template control points for the bezier curve, we can now hide the template bezier curve game object, as we do not need to show it now. We will now create some utility functions for sprites. Create a new c -sharp file and name it SpriteUtils. In this file, we will implement these utility functions for sprites. Double-click and open the file in Visual Studio or your favorite editor. We will create two static methods for working with sprites and textures. The first one is called the create sprite from texture 2D. This method will take a texture 2D object along with parameters specifying a rectangular region within that texture. It will then create a sprite object based on that region using the sprite create method. The pixels per unit parameter will determine how many pixels in the texture correspond to one unit in world space. The sprite type parameter will specify the type of mesh generated for the sprite, defaulting to tight. Finally, it returns the newly created sprite. The second method is called the load texture. This method loads a texture 2D object from a specified resource path using Unity's resources.load method. It takes a string resource path as an input, which represents the path to the texture resource within the project's resources folder. It then returns the loaded texture. Next, we will load the image, where we will apply our template bezier curve to create the jigsaw tiles. Open the Unity editor, right-click on the project's window and create a new folder called Images in Resources. Download the sunflower underscore 140.jpg image provided in the link and save it in the Images folder. We will use this image to create our jigsaw tile. Right-click on the hierarchy window and add an empty game object to the scene. Call the game object as TilesGen. Select TilesGen from the hierarchy window. Go to Inspector and add a new script component. Name this script as TilesGen. Double-click and open TilesGen in Visual Studio or your favorite editor. Add a public string variable named image file name. This variable will store the name of the image to which we want to apply our bezier curve to create the jigsaw tile. We will also add another private variable of type texture 2D of name mTextureOriginal. This private texture 2D variable stores the original texture loaded from the image file. Next, we create a method called createBaseTexture. This method is responsible for creating the base texture and displaying it as a sprite within the Unity scene. It loads the main image texture using the SpriteUtils.loadTexture method, passing in the image file name. It checks if the loaded texture is readable. 
If not, it logs a message and returns indicating that the texture cannot be used further. It adds a sprite renderer component to the current game object to display the sprite. It sets the sprite of the sprite renderer component using the sprite sprite from texture 2 d method, passing in the loaded texture and defining the region to be used as the entire texture. From 00, 0 to mtextureoriginal.width and mtextureoriginal.height. Go to the Unity Editor, select the Tiles Gen Game object, and set the image file name in the inspector to images forward slash sunflower underscore 140. Select the main camera game object and change the transform position X to 70, Y to 70, and size to 100. This way, we can position the view to see our result better. Click play and run. You should now be able to see the sunflower image as shown here. We now have the image that we want to make into a jigsaw tile. We also have our template measure control points that we will use to cut our image. We will standardize our jigsaw tile to be of a regular square size of 140 by 140 pixels. The picture above shows one typical block of an image representing one jigsaw tile area, with ABCD representing the square of 100 by 100 pixels. Next, we will apply our measure curves to the four sides AB, BC, CD, and DA. Also, Remember that for each side, we will have to use our curves in two ways. One will be the usual way, and the other will be the reflected control points along the line. We thus end up with eight variations of the curve. Note that we do not have to recreate the measure curves again and again to achieve the above. Instead, we only have to calculate the measure curve once. Then, we need to transform these points to get all the other points required for the eight measure curves. For curves along the vertical line, we will swap the X and Y coordinates. To understand this, let's visualize our measure curves on the tile. We have four sides of the image. They are the up, right, down, and left. Let's put these into an enumeration type called direction. For this, let's create a new c -sharp class named tile. Right-click on the scripts folder and create a new script file named Tile. Double-click and open it in Visual Studio or your favorite editor. Remove the mono behavior, the start, and the update methods. We are not using mono behavior for this class. It is going to be a plain C-sharp class. We have four sides of the image. They are the up, right, down, and left. Let's put these into an enumeration type called Direction. For each side, we can either apply the normal curve, the inverse of it, or not apply it at all. We won't apply the cutting of the image with the measure curve in cases where the image is on the sides. For each side, we thus get three options. We will represent these three options into another enumeration type called POSNEG type. Go ahead and add this enumeration type to the tile class. The three choices for this enumeration are POS, which is the standard curve, NEG, which is the negation of the curve, and NONE, which means not applying any curve at all. We will add a variable called mOffset. This variable represents an offset used for positioning the curves. It is a 2D vector with integer components, X and Y, which determines how much the curves will be shifted from their default positions. For an image size of 140 by 140 pixels, the M offset will be 20, 20. Then we add the variable called the tile size of type integer. This variable defines the size of the tile. It determines the dimensions of the tile used for calculations related to the positioning and scaling of curves. After that, we add the mLine renderers. This variable is a dictionary that stores line renderer objects based on direction and type. It associates each combination of direction and type with a line renderer, allowing for easy retrieval and management of line renderers for drawing curves. Finally, we add the variable bezcurve. This variable holds a list of vector two points that define a measure curve. It is initialized with the points generated from a measure curve calculation using the measurecurve.pointlist2 method, which takes the template control points as input. BezCurve represents a pre-calculated measure curve that will be utilized as a template for generating actual curves based on different parameters, such as direction and type, within the tile class.
Then we add the create line renderer function. It is a static method designed to streamline the process of generating line renderer components in Unity. Upon invocation, it should instantiate a new game object to serve as the container for the line renderer. Subsequently, it will add a line renderer component to this game object, configuring its properties such as start color, end color, start width, and end width based on the provided arguments. Additionally, it will also assign a material to the line renderer, which determines how the line will be rendered. In this case, it utilizes a default sprite shader. Once all configurations are complete, the function will return the created line renderer, allowing for further customization or immediate use within the Unity scene. Next, we implement the translate points method. We declare this method as public static. It takes two parameters, iList, a list of vector2 points to be translated, and offset, a vector2 representing the amount by which the points should be translated. Inside the method, we use a for loop that iterates over each point in the input list iList. For each point, the method adds the offset vector to it. The translation is performed directly on the points in the input list iList. Next, we implement the invert y method. We declare this method as public static. The purpose of this function is to invert the y-coordinate of each point in a given list of 2D vectors. By iterating through the list, the method replaces each vector's y-coordinate with its negation, effectively reflecting the points across the x-axis. This operation is performed in place, directly modifying the original list. Next, we implement the swap xy method. Similar to our previous two utility methods, we declare this method as public static too. This method will provide a simple means to interchange the x and y coordinates of each point within a given list of 2D vectors. By iterating through the list, the method replaces each vector's x coordinate with its y coordinate and vice versa. These three utility methods, namely the translate points, the invert y, and the swap xy methods, will be used when we want to apply transformations to our template measure curve. We then implement the create curve method. This method will be responsible for creating the various types of curves from the template measure curve by transforming the points. The transformation will be done by the above three utility functions we just implemented. In the method, we initialize some local variables by caching the offset x and y and the tile size. We then copy the template measure into a new list. We will then apply our transformation to these points based on the direction and the type of the curve. The method then enters a switch case statement based on the direction parameter. If direction is up, it then checks the type. If type is pos, it translates the points by adding padding underscore x to x coordinates and padding underscore y plus tile size to y coordinates. If type is neg, it inverts the points along the y axis, then translates it as before. If type is none, it clears the point list and creates a straight line by adding points from the offset to offset x plus 99 in x axis and offset y plus tile size in y axis. We apply similar logic to the other three sides. In essence, what we are trying to do here is to create a set of points based on the template measure points by transforming it to appropriate location of the image. Let's implement the logic for the right, down, and left directions. We will use the three transformation utility functions based on our needs. Remember, the measure curve is the same. We are just applying transformations to these points to either translate, invert, or rotate by swapping the x and y values. Be careful when you code this section as it could be very error prone. Check your implementation and debug if necessary. Finally, we implement the drawker function. The drawker function takes in the parameters for direction, type, and color.
It checks whether a line renderer associated with the given direction and type exists in the mLine renderer's dictionary. If not, it creates a new line renderer with a specified color using the create line renderer function we implemented earlier and adds it to the dictionary. Then, it retrieves the line renderer from the dictionary and sets its start and end color to the provided color. The function also assigns a descriptive name to the line renderer's game object for clarity in the Unity editor. Next, it calls the createCurve function to generate the list of points representing the curve based on the provided direction and type. It sets the position count of the line renderer to match the number of points in the curve and iterates over each point, setting the corresponding position in the line renderer to draw the curve. We have now finished implementing the necessary functionalities for displaying our template measure curves on the different locations of the image tile. We have also created the various possibilities for the curves to be drawn. Now we want to show these curves on the image tile. To do so, go ahead and open the script file tilegen. Add a variable mTile of type tile and initialize it by the default constructor. Now let's show the pos type curve for all directions. To do so, add the draw curve function four times, once each for up, right, down, and left directions with type as pos. Make the color of the curve to be blue. Go to Unity Editor and click Play. You should now be able to see the curves on all four sides. Now let's show the neg type curve for all directions. To do so, comment of the previous four draw curves with pos type and add the draw curve function once more four times, once each for up, right, down, and left directions with type as neg. Make the color of the curve to be red. Go to Unity Editor and click Play. You should now be able to see the inverse curves on all four sides with red color. We have achieved visualizing our measure curves on the image tile. Now let's go a step further and try to mimic the actual jigsaw tile that we can create out of these possible configurations of the curves. For this, we will first create a function in the tile script called hide all curves. This method iterates over all line renderers stored in the mLine renderers dictionary and sets its game object dot set active to false, effectively hiding the associated curve by deactivating its game object. This function provides a quick way to hide all curves stored within the class by toggling their visibility off simultaneously. We now move on to the tilegen script file and create another function called getRandomType. This function will generate a random type and a corresponding color based on a randomly generated float value. We will initially set the type to tile.posnegtype.pos and the color to blue. We will then generate a random float between 0 and 1 using random.range with 0 and 1 as the input parameters. If this value is less than 0 0.5, it assigns type pos and blue color. Otherwise, it assigns the type neg and color red. Finally, it returns a tuple containing the randomly determined type and color. This function serves as a convenient method to obtain randomized type color pairs, which can be used to generate the possible variations of the jigsaw tile in a randomized manner. In the update method, we associate the creation of a randomly created tile with the press of the space key. The update function, upon detecting the spacebar down input, triggers a sequence of actions. Firstly, it calls the hide all curves method of the mTile object, effectively hiding all previously drawn curves. Then it generates a random type and color pair using the getRandomType function and draws a curve in the upward direction with the obtained type and color. Subsequently, it repeats this process for the right, downward, and left directions, each time generating a new random type and color pair and drawing a curve accordingly. Go to Unity Editor, select the tilegen game object, and change the position Z value to 1. This is to ensure that the image is behind the curve in order or drawing. Click play and then press spacebar to view possible configurations of the jigsaw tiles. Keep pressing the spacebar to view other possible configurations. This function mimics the type of jigsaw tile that we could create out of all possible variations of the curves. We will ignore for now the side image tiles where one of the sides will have no curve applied to it. We now know how to draw the measure curves on the image tile.
We shall now proceed to cut the image based on the bezier curves surrounding the image tile. Before we start going into the details of our implementation, let's look at the high-level steps to achieve the solution. First, to cut our texture based on the lines and curves, we will take the following steps. Step 1. Set the original texture to the tile. Step 2. Create a new texture of the same width and height as the original texture and fill it up with complete transparency. Step 3. Set the newly created texture boundary based on the curves and straight lines, depending on what POSNEG type for each direction. Step 4. Do flood fill of the region inside this boundary. The flood fill will set the color of the newly created texture based on the color from the original image. We now proceed with our implementation into our tile script. First, we add a variable called mOriginalTexture, a private variable that stores the input texture. We won't modify this texture. Instead, we will create a new texture called Final Cut and alter this new texture. So, go ahead and add a property called the Final Cut of Texture 2D Type. This Final Cut property lets the user get access to the final texture. Note that we only provide get access to this property. That means we cannot modify the final cut texture outside of this class. We also add a new static read-only variable called transparent color that holds a color will all four components as zero. After that, we define an array mCurve types of size 4, where each element corresponds to a direction specified by the direction enum. Initially, all elements are set to posnegtype.none. We then implement the setCurveType method that allows modifying the curve type for a specific direction by taking in a direction enum and a posnegtype enum and setting the corresponding element in the array to the provided type. Conversely, we also write the getCurveType method that retrieves the curve type for a given direction by indexing into the mCurveTypes array using the provided direction enum and returning the stored POSNEG type. We now create our constructor for the tile class. This constructor initializes a tile object with a given texture 2D as an input parameter. It begins by calculating padding as mOffset.x, as both axes have the same offset. We will refactor our code later to remove the offset and just use the variable padding. We then computes tile size with padding as twice the padding plus the tile size. It initializes the mOriginal texture field with the provided texture. Next, it initializes the texture 2D object named Final Cut with dimensions tile size with padding by tile size with padding and format texture format dot ARGB32. Following this, it iterates over each pixel of Final Cut and sets its color to transparent color. After that, we create a function called apply. This is the main method that does the cutting of the image tile based on the curves and modify the texture Final Cut. We do so by calling two not yet implemented functions, the first being flood fill in it and the second flood fill. These two functions will make all necessary changes to the image Final Cut. To finalize the changes on the Final Cut image, we call FinalCut.apply method. The flood fill algorithm is a technique used in computer graphics to determine and change the color of connected regions in a raster image or bitmap. The algorithm starts from a specified seed point and floods outwards, recursively visiting neighboring pixels or cells in the image. It checks each neighboring pixel to see if it meets certain criteria, typically if it has the same color as the seed pixel and has not been visited yet. If the criteria are met, the pixel's color is changed, and the algorithm continues recursively with that pixel as the new seed. This process continues until all connected pixels meeting the criteria have been visited visited, effectively filling the entire connected region with a new color. We will use the flood fill algorithm to fill the area that falls inside the curves in all four directions. To implement flood fill, we will follow the following algorithm. Step 1. Set up the boundary of the texture based on the curves and straight lines. Mark all pixels that fall in this set of points as visited. Step 2. Take the center pixel of the final cut texture and set the color value from the input texture's center pixel. Mark it as visited. Add this pixel to a stack. Step 3. While the stack of pixels is not empty, go up, left, right, and down to get the next pixel. If the next pixel is already marked as visited, then we do not process that pixel. 
If not, then we set that pixel as visited, set the color from the original texture of the same pixel, and add it to the stack. We will use the method named floodfill in it to perform step 1 and step 2 and the floodfill method to perform step 3. Before we start implementing these two methods, we will need to declare two variables. These are the 2D Boolean array called the mVisited. The mVisited 2D array serves as a grid to store information about whether a particular pixel has been visited during a process like flood fill. The other variable is a stack of vector 2 int called mStack. This stack is used to store coordinates of pixels that need to be processed or visited during a flood fill operation. The stack data structure follows the last in, first out principle, meaning that the last element added to the stack will be the first one to be removed. In the context of flood fill, the stack is used to keep track of pixels that need to be filled with color or otherwise processed. We then add to indices variables needed to track the traversal of the 2D array. We can now start implementing the flood fill init method. This method initializes the flood fill process by first calculating the padding based on the mOffset.x value and determining the size of the tile with padding included. Subsequently, it initializes the 2D Boolean array mVisited with dimensions corresponding to the tile size, ensuring that each pixel's visitation status can be tracked. All elements of mVisited are initially set to false to indicate that no pixels have been visited yet. Then, the method generates a list of points representing the closed curve of the tile by iterating over the mCurve types array and creating curves for each direction and type using the createCurve method. The pixels enclosed by the curve are marked as visited by setting the corresponding elements in the mVisited array to true, preventing the flood fill algorithm from attempting to fill them again. Finally, the flood fill process is initialized from the center of the tile and marking this center pixel as visited. The coordinates of the center pixel are pushed onto the M stack, indicating that it is the starting point for the flood fill operation. Essentially, the flood fill init method sets up the initial state for the flood fill algorithm by preparing the visitation array, marking the pixels enclosed by the curve, and defining the starting point for the flood fill operation. We then implement a utility function called fill. The fill method retrieves the color of a pixel from the original texture at the specified position, adjusts its opacity to fully opaque, and then sets the corresponding pixel in the final cut texture to this modified color. Finally, we will now implement the flood fill method. This method initiates the flood fill operation for the tile. It first calculates the width and height of the tile with padding included based on the M offset and tile size values. Then, it iteratively processes pixels stored in the M stack until there are no more pixels left to process. For each pixel popped from the stack, it fills the corresponding pixel in the final cut texture using the fill utility method we implemented earlier. Next, it checks neighboring pixels in four directions, right, left, up, and down. For each neighboring pixel, it verifies whether it falls within the bounds of the tile, if it has not been visited yet, and if it has a different color than the current pixel. If these conditions are met, the neighboring pixel is marked as visited, and its coordinates are pushed onto the stack for further processing. This process continues until all connected pixels within the tile are filled, ensuring the entire region enclosed by the curve is colored. This method is the heart of cutting and filling our images for a jigsaw tile. This method is also very error-prone. Please take extra attention while implementing this method. It is hard to debug if you make any mistake in coding this method. Let's implement one final method in the tile class called Destroy All Curves. This method iterates through each entry in the mLine renderer's dictionary and destroys the game object associated with it. This ensures that the line renderer and its associated game object are removed from the scene, effectively erasing all curves drawn on the tile. We will use this method when we test out our various jigsaw pieces created with a new tile instance. If we do not delete these line renderers game objects, then we will have dangling line renderers from previous tiles. We have implemented all necessary functionalities to be able to cut our image to jigsaw tiles. 
To test it out, we will use the TileGen script. Due to the recent changes we made to the constructor of the Tile class, we will need to amend our TileGen script. We will also do some refactoring to make TileGen able to handle tests for applying the curves to cut our images. We remove the code within the update method and bring it out to a different function called the TestRandomCurve. We also amend the method such that every time we call this method, we create a new tile. Go to Unity Editor and click Play. Press the spacebar and see that our existing functionality of showing the curves on the image is working. Keep pressing the spacebar to see the various configurations of the curves for jigsaw tiles. Finally, we will now implement the testing of our jigsaw tile creation based on the flood fill method. To do so, go to the TileGen script. In the existing update method, add a new section that when the F key is pressed, we call a method called test tile flood fill. After that, we implement this test tile flood fill method. The test tile flood fill method is designed to test the flood fill functionality of the tile component. Initially, it checks if the M tile reference is not null. If so, it clears all curves drawn on the tile and sets the reference to null. Then it creates a new instance of the tile class using the original texture, assigning it to the tile. Random curve types and colors are generated using the getRandomType method, and curves are drawn on each side of the tile accordingly. The type of each curve is set using the setCurveType method. After drawing and configuring the curves, the apply method is called on the tile to execute the flood fill operation. Finally, the resulting texture from the flood fill operation is applied to the sprite renderer component attached to the game object. Go to Unity Editor and click Play. Now press the F button and see the cutout jigsaw tiles. Keep pressing F and see the various jigsaw pieces. This brings to the end of section 2. Create a jigsaw tile from an existing image. In this third section, we will learn how to create an entire jigsaw board from an image. In the previous section, we learned how to make a jigsaw tile from an existing image using the template bezier curve. Here, in this section, we will apply that knowledge to create an entire jigsaw board from an image. Before we get into the details of the main topic, let's do some minor refactoring in the tile script. Open the tile script and replace vector 2 int m offset with a public static integer padding. Make the necessary changes in the code to adapt to this change. Secondly, make the tile size public static. Making padding and tile size static streamlines code organization and scalability. Centralizing these parameters enhances readability and maintainability, especially in projects with multiple scripts needing access to these values. Click play and check everything is working as expected. We shall now start with the creation of a jigsaw board. Right-click on the project window and create a new scene. Name it scene underscore jigsaw board. This scene will be our sample scene to test out the various features that we will implement in the following sections. Add an empty game object to the scene and name it board gen. Create a new script file named board gen and add it as a component to the board gen game object. Double-click and open board gen in Visual Studio or your favorite editor. Before we create the jigsaw tiles, we first want to display the image we will use to make our jigsaw pieces. Our objective is to supply the name of the image as an input in Unity Editor. We will then load the image and add a 20 pixel padding to the image, typically to show it as a border or a frame. We will create two game objects with sprite renderers. One of these two game objects will display an opaque version of the input picture, and the second game object will display a duplicate of this same image with transparency. We will call this the ghost image. We can decide the value of the transparency later. For now, we can put the transparency value at 10%. The ghost Ghost version of the image will help provide a hint to the player while solving the puzzle. Later on, we will allow turning this ghost image on or off through a settings menu. Let's add the necessary member variables. 
we add a variable public string image file name. This variable will hold the file name of the image that will be used to generate the jigsaw board. We then add mbase sprite opaque and mbase sprite transparent of type sprite. The first variable stores the base opaque sprite loaded from the image file. It will be used to create the jigsaw pieces of the board. The second variable stores the transparent version of the base sprite, which is used to make the ghosted view of the game board. We also create two game objects, mgame object opaque and mgame object transparent, to hold the game object that will display the opaque sprite and the game object that will display the transparent sprite respectively. Finally, we add a variable called ghost transparency to hold the transparency level of the ghosted pixels in the game board. The default value is set to 0.1, which represents 10% opacity. We now create a member function called the load base texture. This function is responsible for loading the base texture from the provided image file name, adding padding to it, and creating a sprite from the modified texture. It first loads the texture from the image file using the spriteutils.load texture with the given image file name. If the texture is not readable, it logs an error message and returns null. It checks if the width and height of the loaded texture are multiples of tile.tile .tile size. If not, it logs an error message and returns null. It then creates a new texture with dimensions increased by twice the padding. The default color of all pixels in the new texture is set to white. After that, it iterates through each pixel of the original texture and copies its color to the corresponding position in the new texture. The alpha value of each pixel is set to 1.0f. After copying the colors, it applies the changes to the new texture using the apply method. Finally, it creates a sprite from the modified texture using spriteutils.create sprite from texture2d and returns the created sprite. We now implement the start method. The method begins by calling the load base texture function to load the base opaque sprite from the image file specified by the image file name. We then create a new empty game object and assign it to mgameObject opaque to hold the opaque sprite. Next, we add a sprite renderer component to this game object and set its sprite to the loaded opaque sprite. We set the sorting layer for the opaque sprite to ensure it renders correctly with other objects in the scene. After that, we create a transparent view of the base sprite by calling the createTransparentView function, which we will implement next. Similar to the opaque sprite, the function creates a new empty game Game object mgame object transparent to hold the transparent sprite. We then add a sprite renderer component to mgame object transparent and set its sprite to the transparent sprite. We also set the sorting layer for the transparent sprite and hide the opaque game object by default. Finally, we set the position of the main camera based on the dimensions of the opaque sprite to ensure a proper view of the game board using a function called set camera position, which we will implement later. We then implement the create transparent view method that we used in the start method. This method in the script is responsible for creating a transparent view of the provided texture, effectively adding a ghosted view of the same image. First, we create a new texture with the same dimensions as the provided texture. We then iterate through each pixel of the new texture. For each pixel, we retrieve the color from the corresponding position in the original texture using the getPixel method. We check if the current pixel is within the padding area by comparing its coordinates with the padding value. If the pixel is within the padding area, we adjust its alpha value to the specified ghost transparency level, effectively making it transparent. After changing the transparency, we set the color of the current pixel in the new texture using the setPixel method. Once all pixel modifications are done, we apply the changes to the new texture using the apply method.
Finally, we create a sprite from the modified texture using the sprite utils .create sprite from texture 2 d and return the created sprite. We now implement the set camera position method, which adjusts the position and orthographic size of the main camera based on the dimensions of the opaque sprite. It positions the camera at the center of the sprite's texture, ensuring it's appropriately distanced from the scene while setting the orthographic size to cover half of the sprite's width, maintaining the aspect ratio. This method guarantees that the camera provides a suitable view of the game board, encompassing the entire opaque sprite within its viewport for player visibility and interaction. Go to Unity Editor, Download the flower underscore 12 underscore 8 dot jpg and put it in a new folder called jigsaws within the images folder. Select the board gen game object from the hierarchy window and set the image file name to images forward slash jigsaws forward slash flower underscore 12 underscore 8. Click play. You should now be able to see the ghosted picture of the flower image as shown here. We shall now proceed with the creation of the jigsaw tiles. For this, we will add some member variables. Open the file board gen again and continue adding the member variables integer numtiles x and numtiles y. These are public properties representing the number of tiles in the horizontal and vertical axes of the jigsaw puzzle, respectively. We then add a two-dimensional array of tile objects representing the individual pieces of the jigsaw puzzle. Similarly, we also add a two-dimensional array of game objects that represents the visual representations of the jigsaw puzzle tiles in the Unity scene. Finally, we add a transform variable called parent for tiles. This public variable represents the parent transform under which the jigsaw puzzle tiles will be instantiated as child objects. This allows for flexibility in organizing the scene hierarchy. We now move on to implement the methods. First of all, we will add the method createGameObject from tile. This function is designed to generate a game object representing a tile in a jigsaw puzzle based on the provided tile object. We begin by creating a new game object instance and assign it a name indicating its position within the grid. The position of the game object is then set using the X index and Y index properties of the tile, taking into account the tile size. A sprite renderer component is added to the game object to render the visual representation of the tile, utilizing a sprite created from the final cut texture of the tile. Additionally, we add a box collider 2D component to facilitate the picking and selection of the tiles. Finally, the function returns the generated game object. We then create the create jigsaw tiles function. This function is responsible for generating the jigsaw puzzle tiles based on the opaque base texture. We begin by obtaining the base texture from the opaque sprite. Then, we calculate the number of tiles in both the horizontal and vertical axes by dividing the width and height of the base texture by the tile size. Next, we initialize arrays mTiles and mTileGame objects to store tile objects and corresponding game object instances for each tile position. We iterate through each tile position, creating a tile object using the create tile function, which we are going to create next. After that, we create a game object using the create game object from tile function. If a parent transform for the tiles is specified, we set the parent transform of each game object. Before we start with the create tile method, let's try to understand the basic requirements of creating the jigsaw pieces. For the provided image, we will mark the image into rows and columns with each tile of size tile size.
Now, for all tiles that are on the left edge, or for column 0, we will need to have the curve type in direction dot left to be none. That means we will have a straight line for the left direction for all tiles on the left edge. For the right up and down directions, we will randomly choose either the POS or the NEG curve type and apply. Similarly, all tiles on the last column will have the right curve type as none, all tiles on the top row will have the up curve type as none, and all tiles on the bottom row will have the down operation as none. Since we will iterate the 2D array of the image tiles from left bottom to right top, we will follow the following rule. For the bottom and leftmost tile, we will set the curve types for left and down directions as straight lines. For right and top directions, we will randomize and choose either POS or NEG curve type. For all other internal tiles of index I and J of column I and row J, we will check the tile on the left, represented by column I1, for its right curve type, and the tile below, represented by row J1, for its up curve type. We will then apply the opposite of this curve type for the tile I and J's left and bottom directions, respectively. We will need to do this so that the tiles fit in once cut out based on the template measure curve. With this knowledge, we now implement the create tile method. The create tile method is responsible for generating a tile object at the specified position I, J in the jigsaw puzzle grid, based on the provided base texture. We create a new tile object using the provided base texture as a parameter. We set the X index and Y index properties of the tile to the values I and J, respectively, indicating its position within the grid. For left side tiles, if the tile is at the leftmost edge, I equal to zero, we set its left curve type to none. Otherwise, we determine the curve type of the left side based on the curve type of the tile on its left. If the left tile's right curve type is neg, we set the current tile's left curve type to pos, and vice versa. For bottom side tiles, if the tile is at the bottom most edge, j equal to zero, we set its bottom curve type to none. Otherwise, we determine the curve type of the bottom side based on the curve type of the tile below it. Similarly, for right and top side tiles, if the tile is at the rightmost or topmost edge, respectively, we set its curve type to none. Otherwise, we randomly assign a positive or negative curve type for the right and top sides. For the right and top sides, if the tile is not at the edge, we randomly decide whether the curve type should be POS or NEG using random dot range. Finally, we apply the changes made to the tile's curve types using the apply method. Calling this method will finalize the final cut image with flood fill to get the desired jigsaw tile. Now go to the start method and add the function call to create jigsaw tiles. Go to Unity Editor. Click play. You should now be able to see all the jigsaw pieces created from the image. We can now create a new empty game object named tiles in the board gen game object. Then we drag and drop this game object to the parent for tiles transform. This will help us to store all the jigsaw tiles under this transform, allowing us to organize our tiles in one transform. Finally, as an enhancement, we will show the animated effect of creating the jigsaw tiles. To do so, we will copy and paste the create jigsaw tiles method and convert it to a coroutine. Change the name of this newly copied function to coroutine underscore create jigsaw tiles with a return type of IE numerator. We then add yield return null in the inner for loop.
After that, go to the start method, comment off the create jigsaw call, and replace it with start coroutine with the input parameter as coroutine underscore create jigsaw tiles. Go to Unity Editor, click play. You should now be able to see the animated effect of all the jigsaw pieces created from the image. With this, we conclude section 3, create a jigsaw board from an image. In the next section, we will apply tile movement using click and drag. We will also implement a custom depth sorting so that the click tiles are in focus. Finally, we will implement the user interface and the game logic of a jigsaw puzzle game. In this fourth section, we will create the final product, the jigsaw puzzle game. In the previous section, we learned how to create an entire jigsaw board from an image. In this section, we will first apply tile movement using click, hold, and drag the tile. We will then implement a custom depth sorting so that the click tiles are in focus. Finally, we will implement the user interface and the game logic of a jigsaw puzzle game. Right-click on the project window and create a new scene. Name it scene underscore jigsaw game. This scene will be our scene to test out the various features that we will implement in the following sections. Add an empty game object to the scene and name it jigsaw board. Select the jigsaw board game object. Go to the inspector and add the script component board gen that we created in the last section. We will continue our work on the same script. Now add a new game object in jigsaw board and name it tiles. Drag and drop this into the field parents for tiles. Set the image file name to be images forward slash jigsaws forward slash flower underscore 12 underscore 8. Click play and see if everything is working as expected. At this point, it should behave the same as we implemented in our previous section. Tile movement, as the name suggests, is a script that allows handling of the tile selection and movement by holding and dragging the left mouse button. Go ahead and create a new C Sharp script and name it Tile Movement. Double click and open the file in Visual Studio or your favorite editor. This class will handle the movement behavior for each tile in our jigsaw puzzle. We then declare a public property called Tile. This property represents the specific tile that this script will control. Moving on, we define a private variable called mOffset. This variable will store the offset between the mouse position and the position of the tile when the mouse button is pressed down. We'll use this offset to ensure smooth dragging behavior. Then, we define a private method called getCorrectPosition. This method will calculate and return the correct position for the tile based on its X index and Y index. We'll use this method later Later to snap the tile to its proper position. Now, let's proceed with the next part of the code by adding the onMouseDown method. This method is called automatically when the mouse button is pressed down while the cursor is over the game object that this script is attached to. Inside this method, we will handle setting the offset between the mouse position and the tile's position. Then, we implement the onMouseDrag method. This method is called automatically when the mouse is dragged while the cursor is over the game object that this script is attached to. Inside this method, we'll handle updating the position of the tile as it's being dragged. After that, we implement the onMouseUp method, which is called automatically when the mouse button is released after being pressed down while the cursor is over the game object that this script is attached to. Inside this method, we'll handle snapping the tile to its correct position if it's close enough to it. The close enough distance is set to 20 units. And that's it. We've implemented the Tile Movement class, which allows us to handle mouse input for dragging and snapping tiles in our jigsaw puzzle game. We will now set this script component to each tile. For that, open up the BoardGen script, Go to the create game object from tile function and add the tile movement component to the tile game object as shown. Go to the Unity editor, right click on the project window and add an event system. Now click play. Once the tiles are generated, you can now click on any tile, drag it to different locations and release it anywhere you release your mouse. Go ahead and try it out. In our jigsaw board, all the tiles can be in the same layer with the same depth order. 
However, based on which tile we pick, we want to bring it up in the render order to draw it on top of all other tiles and set the correct Z value so that Raycast can also pick it up even if it overlaps with different tiles. As such, we will need to sort the tiles based on depth values. This is to facilitate the ordering of tiles when we click and select them. Sorting layer and render order only allow the order of rendering. That is not sufficient for us as we also want to choose the tile on top and not one hidden below. To obtain a proper Z sorting so that our Raycast works, we will need to set the Z value of the tiles at runtime and change the value when we select a tile. Go ahead and add a new C Sharp file and name it Tile Sorting. Double click and open the file in Visual Studio or your favorite editor. First of all, we remove Mono Behavior, as we do not want this class to derive from Mono Behavior, and then we remove the Start and the Update methods. Now, let's add a private variable called msort indices of type list of sprite renderer. This list will keep track of all the sprite renderers we want to sort. Next, we create a constructor method, which we keep empty for now. We then define a public method called clear. This method clears the msort indices list, effectively resetting the sorting. After that, we create a method called add, which adds a new sprite renderer to the sorting list. Additionally, we set the rendering order for the sprite renderer. We have not implemented the setRenderOrder method yet. We now add the remove method. This method removes a sprite renderer from the sorting list. It also updates the rendering order for the remaining sprite renderers in the list. After that, we implement the bringToTop method. This method brings a specific sprite renderer to the top of the sorting order. It removes the sprite renderer from the list and then re-adds it, effectively placing it at the highest rendering order. Finally, we implement the setRenderOrder method. This private method sets the rendering order of a sprite renderer and adjusts its position on the z-axis to ensure correct sorting. We have implemented the Tile Sorting class, which handles sorting sprite renderers in our Jigsaw Puzzle game to ensure proper rendering order of the tiles. We will now make use of this class. To do so, we open the tile script file and add a new static variable called Tile Sorting of Type Tile Sorting. After that, we open the Tile Movement script file and add a new variable called the MSprite Renderer. This variable will keep a reference to the sprite renderer component. Create the start method and store the reference to the sprite renderer component into this newly created variable. After that, call the bringToTop function call of the tiles renderer class within the onMouseDown method with the msprite renderer as the input parameter. Adding this ensure that whichever tile is clicked is brought to the top, which is what we want. Go to Unity Editor and click Play. You should now be able to a reorder a tile based on its selection. Click any jigsaw tile. This click tile now should be on top of all other tiles. We will now create an abstract singleton class that can be used as a template framework for future singletons. Go to Unity Editor and create a new script called Singleton in the Scripts folder. Double-click and open it in Visual Studio or your favorite editor. In computer programming, a singleton is a design pattern that restricts the instantiation of a class to only one object. It ensures that there is only a single instance of the class throughout the entire application and provides a global point of access to that instance. Singletons are commonly employed in scenarios where global access to a single instance is preferable. In Unity game projects, singletons can be invaluable for providing global access to critical objects and game data that persists across multiple scenes. Singletons can also aid performance optimization by reducing the overhead associated with redundant object creation and destruction. While singletons offer significant benefits in Unity game development, it's crucial to use them judiciously to avoid potential drawbacks, such as tight coupling and global state proliferation. We recommend using only one singleton object for a game project. 
We start by defining a namespace called patterns and declare a generic abstract class named singleton. This class is intended to be a singleton, meaning that only one instance of it can exist throughout the application. It's constrained to accept only types that derive from component in Unity. We declare a private static field S underscore instance of type T. This field will hold the single instance of the class. We then define the instance property. This property is responsible for returning the single instance of the class. It's implemented using a getter method. If the s underscore instance is null, it tries to find an existing instance of type t in the scene using find object of type. If no instance is found, it creates a new game object, assigns it the name of the type t, adds a component of type t to it, and sets s underscore instance to this new component. Finally, it returns the s underscore instance. We now move on to the awake method. Here, we ensure that only one instance of the singleton exists. If s underscore instance is null, it sets s underscore instance to the current instance, which is this, and makes the game object persistent across scene changes using don't destroy on load. If s underscore instance is not null, it destroys the game object to prevent multiple instances. This singleton class can be inherited by other classes in Unity to ensure that only one instance of those classes exists throughout the application. We now create another new script file called the game app. Double click and open it in Visual Studio or your favorite editor. Remove mono behavior and inherit from the singleton class provided by the patterns namespace we created before. This means that game app will implement the singleton pattern, ensuring that only one instance of game app exists throughout the application. After that, we declare three public properties for now. Later, we will extend this class based on our needs. First, we have the tile movement enabled of type bool property. This property represents whether tile movement is currently enabled in the game. Then, we declare another public property named seconds since start of type double. It represents the number of seconds that have elapsed since the start of the game. Finally, we declare the total tiles in correct position of type int. This property represents the total number of tiles currently in the correct position in the game. Now, we move on to creating the game menu. For this tutorial, we will keep our game simple. We will implement the user interface as shown on the screen. We will primarily have two sets of UI items. The first set contains only the play button. This play button is displayed only after all the jigsaw tiles are created. The second set includes the show hint button, the exit button, the tiles in place versus the total number of tile text fields, and the timer that shows the time that has elapsed since you started this jigsaw game. These UI elements are only shown after we click the play button. The tile movement enabled property should only be enabled after all the tiles are shuffled. This is when the timer should also start. Download the zip file called UI underscore assets, unzip and place it in the resources folder of your Unity project. This folder contains some icons and a font that we will use for the tutorial. Now, let's go ahead and create the UI elements. Go to hierarchy window and add a new canvas. Select the canvas game object from the hierarchy and go to the inspector. Go to the canvas scaler section and change the UI scale mode to scale with screen size. Change the values of reference resolution to 1600 by 900. Now select the canvas game object again, right click and add a panel. Select this panel and rename it to top panel. Go to Inspector and choose the Anchor Preset to Top Center. Set the X and Y to be 0 and minus 75 respectively. Then, set the width to 1600 and the height to 75. Right-click on the top panel and add a new image UI element. Name it Image Close. Select this image, go to the Inspector and choose the Anchor Preset to Top Right. Set the X and Y to be minus 75 and minus 40 respectively. Then, set the width to 70 and the height to 70. Drag and drop the icon underscore blue sprite to the source image field. Now, select this image close game object, right click it, and add a new legacy button UI element. Select this button, go to the inspector and choose the anchor preset to center center. Set the X and Y to be 0 and 0 respectively. Then, set the width to 60 and the height to 60. Drag and drop the icon underscore close sprite to the source image field. Once again, right click on the top panel and add a new image UI element. Name it image hint. 
Select this image, go to the inspector and choose the anchor preset to top right. Set the X and Y to be minus 75 and minus 125 respectively. Then, set the width to 70 and the height to 70. Drag and drop the icon underscore blue sprite to the source image field. Now, select this image hint game object, right-click it, and add a new image UI element. Select this image, go to the inspector and choose the anchor preset to center center. Set the X and Y to be 0 and 0, respectively. Then, set the width to 60 and the height to 60. Drag and drop the icon underscore hint sprite to the source image field. Select the top panel game object from the hierarchy, right-click it, and add a new image UI element. Name it Image Tiles Count. Select this image, go to the inspector and choose the anchor preset to center center. Set the X and Y to be 500 and 0, respectively. Then, set the width to 250 and the height to 70. Drag and drop the icon underscore blue sprite to the source image field. Now, select the image tiles count game object from the hierarchy and right-click it and add a new image UI element. Name this newly added image as image dark. Select this image, go to the inspector and choose the anchor preset to center center. Set the X and Y to be 60 and 0, respectively. Then, set the width to 115 and the height to 55. Then, click on the color field of the image and set the color to RGB to 100, 100, 200. Once again, select the image tiles count game object from the hierarchy and right-click it and add a new image UI element. Name this newly added image as image light. Select this image, go to the inspector and choose the anchor preset to center center. Set the X and Y to be minus 60 and zero respectively. Then set the width to 115 and the height to 55. Leave the color of the image as white. Once more, select the image tiles count game object from the hierarchy and right-click it and add two legacy text UI items. The first one renamed to text tiles in place. Go to the inspector and choose the anchor preset to center center. Set the X and Y to be minus 60 and zero respectively. Then set the width to 120 and the height to 60. Now set the font type to Micros, font style to bold, font size to 40 and alignment to center. Set the default string to display on the text field to zero. Rename the second text field to text total tiles. Go to the inspector and choose the anchor preset to center center. Set the X and Y to be 60 and zero respectively. Then set the width to 120 and the height to 60. Now set the font type to Micros, font style to bold, font size to 40 and alignment to center. Set the default string to display on the text field to zero. Finally, we will now create the timer. To do so, select the top panel game object from the hierarchy and right-click it and add a new image UI element. Name this newly added image as image timer. Select this image, go to the inspector and choose the anchor preset to center center. Set the X and Y to be minus 615 and zero respectively. Then set the width to 250 and the height to 70. Drag and drop the icon underscore blue sprite to the source image field. Now, select the game object image timer, right click and add a text UI item. Rename it to text timer. Go to the inspector and choose the anchor preset to center center. Set the X and Y to be zero and zero, respectively. Then set the width to 200 and the height to 60. Now set the font type to Micros, font style to bold, font size to 40 and alignment to center. Set the default string to display on the text field to zero hour, zero minutes and zero seconds. With this, we have completed the creation of the top panel. Now we move on to create a bottom panel. Select the canvas game object from the hierarchy, right click and add a panel. Select this panel and rename it to bottom panel. Go to inspector and choose the anchor preset to bottom center. Set the X and Y to be zero and 75 respectively. Then set the width to 800 and the height to 100. Then select this bottom panel game object, right click it and add a new legacy button UI element. Select this button, Go to the inspector and choose the anchor preset to center center. Set the X and Y to be zero and zero, respectively. Then set the width to 250 and the height to 80. Drag and drop the icon underscore play sprite to the source image field. With this, we conclude creating the canvas with the necessary UI elements. Finally, select the main camera from the hierarchy. 
Go to the inspector and change the clear flags field to solid color. Then change the background color RGB to 50, 100, and 200. Go to Unity Editor, select the game window and change the aspect ratio to 16 by 9. Click play and see the newly implemented UI. You can also drag the jigsaw tiles and test if everything is working as expected. We will now implement the necessary code for this canvas. Right-click on the project window and, in the Scripts folder, create a new script called Menu. Double-click this script and open it in Visual Studio or your favorite editor. This menu class is going to be responsible for managing some aspects of our game's menu interface. We're going to use this class to control various UI elements and handle user interactions. In our menu class, we declare a delegate named delegate on click. This delegate represents a method that we can call when a button is clicked. Then we declare a public field called button play on click of type delegate on click, which will hold a reference to a method that we want to execute when the play button is clicked. Moving on, we declare some public variables to hold references to UI elements in our menu. These include panels, panel top panel, and panel bottom panel, and text components, text time, text total tiles, and text tiles in place, which we will use to display information to the player. After this, we will implement a coroutine that will allow to fade in a panel containing UI elements. This method, called fade in UI, is responsible for gradually fading in the UI elements of a specified panel over a given duration. We achieve this by adjusting the transparency of the UI elements over time. We start by setting the alpha of all UI elements to zero, then gradually increase it to one over the specified duration. Next, we have a couple of methods, set enable bottom panel and set enable top panel that enable or disable the visibility of our bottom and top panels, respectively. If the provided flag is true, we activate the corresponding panel game object and fade in its UI elements using our fade in UI method. Moving on, we have a method called onClickPlay. This method is called when the play button is clicked, and this is where we invoke the delegate button play on click. We then implement the set time in seconds method. These methods will enable us to dynamically update the time that has elapsed since the start of this jigsaw puzzle in hours, minutes, and seconds. After that, we implement two more methods. They are the set total tiles and set tiles in place. These methods display the total tiles count in the jigsaw puzzle and the total tiles in place count based on the current state of our game. To start playing our jigsaw game, we will need to shuffle the tiles. Let's go ahead and implement the shuffling of tiles in this subsection. Double click and open the board gen script in Visual Studio or your favorite editor. We start by adding a few variables. First, we declare a public variable named menu of type menu and initialize it with a value of null. Then, we declare a private list named regions. This list will serve as a collection to store rectangular regions used for positioning tiles while shuffling. After that, we declare another private list named active coroutines, which will serve as a collection to store references to coroutines. We begin with a method called 
coroutine underscore move over seconds. This coroutine is designed to move a game object smoothly from its current position to a specified destination over a given duration of time. It takes three parameters, the game object we want to move, the target position we want to move it to, and the duration of the movement in seconds. First off, we initialize a couple of variables, elapsed time to keep track of how much time has passed since the movement started, and starting position to store the initial position position of the object we're moving. Next, we enter a while loop that runs as long as the elapsed time is less than the specified duration. This loop ensures that the movement occurs smoothly over the desired duration. Inside the loop, we use vector 3.lerp to interpolate between the starting position and the target end position based on the ratio of elapsed time to total duration. This mechanism gradually moves the object from its starting position to the end position over time, creating a smooth transition. We then increment the elapsed time by the time that has passed since the last frame using time.delta time. After that, we yield control back to the coroutine system for one frame. Once the elapsed time exceeds the specified duration, the loop exits, and we set the object's position to the end position to ensure that it reaches its final destination precisely. Next, we implement the shuffle method. This method is responsible for shuffling the position of a tile within predefined regions on the screen. First, we check if the list regions is empty. If it is, we initialize it with two rectangular regions. These regions define areas on the screen where our tiles can be shuffled. They are positioned on the left and right sides of the screen, leaving some space between the tiles and the board. Next, we determine the final position of the tile after shuffling. We randomly select one of the regions from the regions list. Then, within the selected region, we generate a random point using the random dot range for both the X and Y coordinates. This point represents the final position where we want to move the tile after shuffling. After determining the final position, we create a vector 3 pos to hold the X, Y, and Z coordinates of the final position of the game object. Now, we call the coroutine coroutine underscore move over seconds to move the tile smoothly from its current position to the final position over a duration of one second. We start the coroutine by calling start coroutine and passing in the tile, the final position, and the duration of the movement as parameters. Finally, we keep track of the coroutine by adding it to the list we defined earlier called the active coroutines. After this, we now implement another coroutine called coroutine underscore shuffle. This coroutine is responsible for shuffling the positions of all the tiles in our game grid. We start by iterating over each tile in our grid using nested for loops. The outer loop iterates over the rows, and the inner loop iterates over the columns. Inside the nested loops, we call the shuffle method we implemented earlier for each tile passing in the game object representing the tile. This shuffle method is responsible for randomly positioning the tile within predefined regions on the screen, as we discussed earlier. After shuffling each tile, we yield control back to the coroutine system for one frame. Once we've shuffled all the tiles in our grid, we wait for all the shuffle coroutines to finish before proceeding. We do this by iterating over the active coroutines list, which contains references to all the shuffle coroutines that are currently running. For each coroutine in the list, we check if it's still active and yield control back to the coroutine system for one frame using yield return null. Finally, once all the shuffle coroutines have finished, we call the onFinish shuffling method which we are yet to implement. Then, we implement the method called shuffle tiles. This method just calls the coroutine coroutine underscore shuffle. We will now implement the method called onFinish shuffling. This method is called after all the tiles have been shuffled. First, we clear the active coroutines list. Next, we call the setEnableBottomPanel method of the menu object to hide the bottom panel. Then, we start a coroutine called coroutine underscore call after delay, which we have not yet implemented. This coroutine is used to delay the execution of a method. In this case, we're delaying the call to enable the top panel of the menu by one second. 
After that, we enable tile movement in the game by setting the tile movement enabled property of the game app, singleton, instance to true. Next, we start a timer using the start timer method, which we have not yet implemented. We then update the values displayed on our menu UI by setting the total number of tiles. We will then implement the coroutine named coroutine underscore call after delay. This coroutine takes two parameters, function, which is an action or method that we want to call after a delay, and delay, which is the amount of time we want to wait before calling the function. Inside the coroutine, we use yield return new wait for seconds method to wait for the specified delay. After waiting for the specified delay, we call the provided function by invoking it. Finally, we implement the start timer and other associated functions necessary to implement the timer. We will start with a method called start timer. When start timer is invoked, it initiates a coroutine named coroutine underscore timer. Coroutine underscore timer is a coroutine that continuously increments the elapsed time in one second intervals and updates the displayed time on the game menu UI. Finally, we implement the stop timer function that halts the timer by stopping the coroutine. Before we can test and play our application from the Unity editor, we will need to enable the bottom panel display after we have created all the jigsaw tiles, and we will also need to add the delegate to the play button on click event. So go ahead and add the two calls in the coroutine underscore create jigsaw tiles method. First, we add menu.set enable bottom panel to true, and then we set the delegate to button play on click event to shuffle tiles method we created before. Setting this delegate will allow the shuffling of the jigsaw tiles as soon as we click on the play button in the bottom panel. Go to the Unity editor. Select the canvas game object from the hierarchy window and go to the inspector. Set the specific fields in the menu script by dragging and dropping the UI elements, as shown here. Be careful to associate the correct UI elements with the correct fields. Then, select the button play, go to the inspector and associate the onClick event with the function called onClickPlay from the menu class. Once you have associated all these UI elements with specific fields in the menu script, select the jigsaw board game object from the hierarchy. Then, drag and drop the canvas to the menu field in the BoardGen script. We now select both the top panel and the bottom panel and hide these two UI elements from the inspector by default. We will enable these UI elements from the script based on when we finish creating our jigsaw tiles and when we finish our shuffling. Click play. You should now see the jigsaw tiles being created. Once the tile creation is completed, the bottom panel with the play button shows up. Click the play button. You should now see the tiles being shuffled to the regions we defined. Once the shuffling is completed, we should see the top panel appear. We may have made an error in the menu script. We do not see the timer being updated. Double click and open the menu script and go to the function called set time in seconds. Check if the text UI element is correct. We should set the text UI element to text time. Go to Unity Editor again and click play. Once the jigsaw tiles are generated, click on the play button. You should now see the timer changing. We will now proceed to implement the remaining functionality. We start with the show hint icon. We want to show the player the actual opaque image when the player clicks and holds this button. The image should be shown to the user as long as the user presses the left mouse button. We will need to implement a special script for this. Go ahead, right click on the projects window and in the scripts folder, create a new script called the hold button. Double click and open in Visual Studio or your favorite editor. The hold button class implements two interfaces, I pointer down handler and I pointer up handler. These interfaces are used to detect when the user presses down on the button and releases it. We first declare a private boolean variable is pressed. This variable keeps track of whether the button is currently pressed down or not. Then we add two unity events called on press and hold and on release. Then we implement the on pointer down. This method is called when the user presses down on the button. We set is pressed to true here.
Similarly, we create the onPointerUp method, which is called when the user releases the button. Inside this method, we set is pressed to false. Then we implement the update method. Here, we check the value of is pressed. If the button is pressed, we invoke the on press and hold event. If the button is not pressed, we invoke the on release event. After that, open the BoardGen script again and add two functions. The first function is called show opaque image. Here we set mgameObject opaque active to true. Similarly, we create hide opaque image, where we set mgameObject opaque active to false. We then go to the Unity editor. Select the image hint UI element and add the hold button component. After that, add a new on press and hold event and associate it with the show opaque image function call from the BoardGen script. Similarly, add a new on release event and associate it with the hide opaque image function. Click play. You should see the jigsaw tiles being created. Once the tile creation is completed, the bottom panel with the play button shows up. Click the play button. You should see the top panel appear after the shuffling is completed. Click on the Show Hint icon. Once you click, you should be able to see the opaque picture of entire jigsaw puzzle. We shall now move on to display the number of tiles in place on our text UI element. This value will display the number of jigsaw tiles the player has correctly placed. For this, double click and open the Tile Moment script in Visual Studio or your favorite editor. We first add a new delegate called the delegate on tile in place. Then we declare a variable called on tile in place of type delegate on tile in place. This delegate will be called whenever a correct tile is in place. We then go to the on mouse up method, and inside the if distance is less than 20 units check, we invoke the delegate. We shall now implement the on tile in place function call. For this, we open the BoardGen script file again. Go to the end and create a new function called onTileInPlace, which takes a tile movement as input parameter. This function is responsible for handling what should occur when a tile is placed in its correct position. Inside this function, we increment the total tiles in correct position property of the game app singleton instance by one. We then turn off the tile movement component attached to the tile. This prevents the tile from being moved further once it's in its correct position. After that, we retrieve the sprite renderer component attached to the tile's game object and remove it from custom depth sorting. We now change the sorting layer of the tile's sprite renderer to tiles in place. We then check if all tiles are in their correct positions by comparing total tiles in correct position with the total number of tiles. If they are equal, that means we have completed solving the puzzle. For now, we simply log a message indicating that the game is finished. Later on, we will implement a new scene to display the puzzle completion screen. Finally, we update the display of the number of tiles in their correct positions in the UI by calling the menu.setTilesInPlace. To set this function to each tile's tile movements on tile in place delegate, we go to the onFinish shuffling method and add code that will iterate through all tiles and set the function to that tile movements on tile in place delegate. Go to the Unity editor and click play. You should see the jigsaw tiles being created. Once the tile creation is completed, the bottom panel with the play button shows up. Click the play button. You should see the top panel appear after the shuffling is completed. Find one of the corner tiles and put that tile in place. You should see the count of the tiles in place to one. Find another corner tile and put that in place too. Now you should see the count go to two. You can continue to play and place tiles in the correct positions. We shall now handle the game completion screen. Let's go ahead and create the UI for the game completion screen. We will keep it simple. Go to the Unity Editor. Select the canvas and add a new panel UI element. Rename it to Panel Game Completion. Select this panel. Go to the inspector and set the color to RGB 50, 100, and 200, respectively. Set the transparency to 200. Now add a new legacy text UI element to this panel. Select the text and go to the inspector. Set the width to 800 and height to 100. Add the text congrats you have completed the puzzle to the text field. Change the font to micros. 
font size to 30 and color to white. Select text alignment to center center. After that, select the panel again and add a legacy button and rename the button to button play again. Select the button, go to the inspector and set the X and Y to minus 60 and minus 150 and the width and height to 250 and 60 respectively. Set the RGB color of the button to 30, 50 and 150 respectively. Set the text field of the button to play again, color to white, font to micros and font size to 30. We will now create another button called Exit. Select the panel again, add a legacy button and rename the button to Button Exit. Select the button, go to the inspector and set the X and Y to 120 and minus 150 and the width and height to 160 respectively. Set the RGB color of the button to 150, 20 and 100 respectively. Set the text field of the button to Exit, color to white, font to micros and font size to 30. After that, hide the entire panel game completion panel from the inspector. After this, we make the necessary changes to our menu script. Double click and open the menu script in Visual Studio or your favorite editor. First, we add a variable called panel game completion of type game object. Then go to the end of the class and add the method called set enable game completion panel. This method takes a Boolean parameter flag, which determines whether the game completion panel should be enabled or disabled. If the flag is true, we call the fade in UI method passing panel game completion as an argument. After that, we implement two more methods. The first method is called the on click exit. This method is called when the exit button is clicked. Inside this method, we call application.quit to exit the application. This will close the game if it's running in a standalone build. Do note that the application.quit call is ignored in the editor, and it will only work in a standalone build. The second method is called on click play again. This method is called when the play again button is clicked. Inside this method, we call scenemanager.loadscene to load the same scene named scene underscore jigsaw game. Basically, we are reloading the same scene. We then open the BoardGen script file, go to the method named onTile in place, and amend our code within the game completion check. If our puzzle has been solved, then we first disable the top panel and then enable the game completion panel. We now go to the Unity editor. Associate the field panel game completion with the UI element panel game completion by dragging and dropping to the appropriate field. Then select the exit button and add the on click event with the on click exit method. After that, select the play again button and add the on click event with the on click play again function. We won't be able to test the game completion screen yet, as our jigsaw puzzle has many tiles to play, and it will take a long time for us to complete. We shall now add some more images. Go ahead and add the remaining images from the downloaded jigsaw underscore images folder. We shall now implement a simple list of images that go from a lower number of tiles to a higher number of tiles. Once we finish one puzzle, we move on to the next puzzle in an increasing order of difficulty. After we have finished all these images, we start from the beginning again. To do so, we will make changes to the game app Singleton. Double-click the game app script file and open it in Visual Studio or your favorite editor. First, we declare a list of strings named Jigsaw Image Names. This list will hold the names of the images we'll use for our Jigsaw puzzles. Next, we'll need an integer variable to keep track of the current index of the Jigsaw Image Names list. Now, let's implement a method called GetJigsawImageName. This method will return the next image name from our list each time it is called. We will increment image index to move to the next image in the list. If we reach the end of the list, we will loop back to the beginning. We can now use this method in the start method of the BoardGen Mono Behavior class. Open the BoardGen script file. First, we will make the image file name variable from public to private. Then go to the start method and assign the image file name by getting the value from calling gameapp.getJigsawImageName. Go to the Unity editor.
Drag all the images from the Jigsaw underscore images downloaded folder to the Jigsaws folder in Unity project. Make each image read and write enable. After that, we will create a new empty game object in the Unity editor. We will name it Game App. Then we will add the game app script as a component to this game object. After selecting the game app game object, we will navigate to the inspector panel and locate the jigsaw image names field of the game app component. Here we will add the image file names based on the sorted order. We shall now make two final changes before we conclude. The first will be to set the camera scale. This change is to adjust for different jigsaw images with different rows and columns of tiles. Open the BoardGen file and go to the set camera position method. Here, we calculate the smaller dimension, either the width or height, of a sprite's texture associated with the M-based sprite opaque sprite. Subsequently, we set the orthographic size of the main camera in the scene based on the smaller dimension. We multiply the smaller dimension by a constant value. In our case, we put it as 0 0.8. After that, we go to the method on finished shuffling. Here, we add the call to tile.tilesorting.bring to top to ensure that tiles maintain correct depth values. We then go to the on tile in place method and amend some code. We first destroy the tile movement component if the tile is in place. Then we reset the values of the game app.total tiles in correct position to zero. We also reset gameapp.seconds since start equal to zero. The second change is to disable tile movement when the tile movement enabled property returns a false value. Open the tile movement script. Go to on mouse down method and do an early exit if gameapp.instance.tile movement enabled is false. Similarly, we also change the on mouse drag and on mouse up methods. Go to the Unity editor and click play. The game will now start with the least number of tiles. You can continue to play and finish the game. Once you finish a jigsaw puzzle, you will now see the game completion screen. Click play again button. You shall now see a new puzzle image appear. And that's it. We have completed our tutorial on how to create a jigsaw puzzle game. We hope you have enjoyed the tutorial and have learned something new.